so tonight our featured speaker uh, is from our research department. We do education, research, stewardship, and coastal training at the Wells Reserve. And Dr. Jason Goldstein is our research director. And he's going to uh, share with us some of the research that's happening at the reserve on green crabs. So Jason, take it away. And oh, before I forget uh, questions, Jason will take them throughout. So you don't have to wait until the end. Interrupt you can me whenever you want. Ask your You're burning questions throughout. So, okay. Um, All right. I, wanted, I want to start by showing you why I left the video for a minute. I don't know if you can see this. That's a little baby green crab, about the size of my fingernail. And um, we just found that. Today, we find them all the time. Um, they're pretty common in our marsh. And uh, many of you may say, oh, you know, I'm not sure what they look like. Are they always green? They're not always green. Um, they all, they, but they all have five spines from, from the eye down to the side of their carapace, this shell here. They have five spines. So the way to remember that is green has five letters and five spines. So if you're ever in doubt, just count the number of spines. Use a hand lens if it's really small. Um, that will tell you that it's a green crab and not some other kind of crab. We do have other species here, which I'll briefly touch on um, later this evening. So I'm going to go into my presentation mode. And uh, Suzanne, let me know if this works, just to make, I know we tested it already, but can you? Yep. looks you, good. Okay, great. So thank you everybody for um, giving me the time and you know, joining in on this virtual presentation. I hope that next time we'll, we'll do this in person and I'll maybe, you know, have some green crabs in the lab and you can play around with them. Um, so what I wanted to talk about tonight is this um, invasive species, very invasive species, very prolific invasive species. And, um, you know, most people, many people come to Maine because we're the vacation land state. And uh, we see that every summer and fall. And uh, lots of people come to Wells and lots of people come to Maine. And, um, but this is one animal that we probably don't really care for or that we would not want in Maine. Um, so that's why I call it closing vacation land because if we could close it to green crabs, that would probably be a good thing. Um, they are everywhere in our marsh. So that's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about some research, some monitoring. We're going to talk about collaborative issue, uh, collaborative projects that we have with other stakeholders and the engagement with those stakeholders as well. Uh, before I do that, I want to acknowledge um, some of my close collaborators, uh, Laura Crane and Dr. Ben Gutzler, who are um, both staff here at, in our research department, and they are really hardworking uh, crustacean folks who have done a lot of work on green crabs in our marshes and in our estuary. So I want to acknowledge them. We've had two um, Noah Holling scholars. They're, these are undergraduate students from um, universities across the country. I wanted to acknowledge Hannah and Emily who have been really active um, in our green crab program and have done some great work to help us boost our research. Um, and my collaborators, uh, Dr. Gabby Bratt and uh, Professor Nathan Fury from UNH, and uh, as well as Dr. Steve Jury from um, St. Joseph's College of Maine. So lots of collaborators, we have funding through the Salt and Stall Kennedy Fisheries Program for this project, or for most of our green crab work. And so I wanted to acknowledge that as well. I also want to acknowledge the native lands for which um, the Wells Reserve is located on and, um, and the beauty of those lands. And I, I think that many of you on this call know what I'm talking about. Wells Reserve is a, a beautiful place, Long Home Farm, and we have these incredible beaches, estuaries, um, marshes, upland forests, swamps. And so if you haven't been to Wells Reserve, if this is your first time tuning in on a talk about projects at Wells Reserve, please come visit us. 
Um, it's a it's a great place to be, and uh, fall is an incredible time of year here. Um, as Suzanne mentioned, you know the National Reserve National Estuarine Research Reserve System um, contains uh, a multifaceted kind of um, program. So we have research, of course. Uh, we also have education. We have stewardship. We do coastal training, and we have fun. We we show people what it, how fun it is to be outside in these really amazing coastal habitats. We are the only national reserve in Maine. Um, there are four in New England. Actually, now there's five. There's a new reserve in Connecticut on Avery Point uh, near the mouth of the Connecticut River. So. Um, if you haven't been to some of these other reserves, or maybe you have, they're all really great places. So um, they're great in one way by going there and just enjoying the beauty. They're also amazing because they cover over a million acres of land and water. Um, estuaries, uh, predominantly three quarters of our estuaries are nurseries to more uh, than 75% than of all fish and shellfish that are harvested in the United States. Um, <clears throat> that translates to over four billion dollars uh, ecosystem services and um, 63 million data points are how many water quality and weather observations that we make that the reserve system makes um, over the course of their history. So we have quite a bit of data, we have quite a bit of land and water and amazing places to protect and to do research with. So we're really proud of that. And I just wanted to share those numbers with you because it's important to acknowledge that as well. Okay, so just a very brief overview. Um, the research and monitoring program at the Wells Reserve is aimed at uh, water quality monitoring. That's through our system-wide monitoring program or SWAMP. Um, but then we also have a ton of other um, elective monitoring that we do. Some of it is short term, but most of it is long term monitoring. So plankton toads, putting a net in the water and looking for larval fish and crabs and things like that. Um, I was just in the marsh today with Laura and others um, over in the web hand by Drake's Island. We were doing salt marsh monitoring. So we're looking at the effect of sea level rise and we're looking at the effect of crabs and their impact on marshes. Uh, so we do that many, many different ways. That would be like a whole separate talk we could give. Um, so that's a core piece of our monitoring. And then we have some other monitoring programs like the Marine Invasive Monitoring Program throughout the coast of Maine, Southern Maine especially, where we're looking at um, invasive species monitoring. So we'll get into some of these later, but I just wanted to underscore the, the, the portfolio of monitoring that we have. And then crab monitoring is really something that's fairly new here. Um, we kind of fell into it a little bit. Um, it's also something that really connects many other facets of our monitoring. So um, when you look at this diagram here, you look at all these, all these different things, water quality, invasive species, crabs, salt marshes, plankton. What do they have in common? Well, we're using crabs essentially as our sort of sentinel organism to help us understand uh, climate change in Southern Maine coastal waters. So it's an important facet that I wanted to point out because although salt marsh vegetation is important, although weather and water chemistry are really important, the crabs are telling us how the marsh is changing as well. And we'll get into that with green crabs tonight. Um, I'm sure that most of you know that the Gulf of Maine itself, where we're located, uh, is changing and is changing rapidly. Um, this is a, a, a plot of temperature. This is just uh, sea surface temperature in, Fahrenheit, in degrees Fahrenheit from uh, recorded um, uh, data sets that extend from 1895 up to just about the present. And you can see the trend, especially in the last 50 years or so, uh, shows you a um, 0 0.059 degrees increase in temperature since 1960. Um, 
Is that bad? Well, most of our models show that that's a really rapid increase. And so is it bad? Maybe. Is it probably too fast? Yes. And so this has been published and talked about. It's been on the news, NPR, lots of different venues. Another way to look at it, though, is to look at the summer sea surface temperature anomalies. OK, so on the left hand side, you'll see degrees Celsius. On the right hand side, you'll see degrees Fahrenheit. And this is for each decade over the last 30 years or so, how, uh, how much has temperature altered? OK, so if you look at 1990, we're really we were our temperature anomalies were not were really negligible. But if you look at our temperature anomalies since 2010, especially that portion of that blue dashed line, you'll see that we have you know anywhere from a one to two degree, sometimes up to four degrees difference in temperature um, from year to year, and that's significant. That's a significant increase, and so how that manifests itself is plants and animals and ecosystems in the Gulf of Maine are going to respond to that change. And that change is real. We measure that. Um, we measure that here at our reserve, but it's also measured in many other places throughout the Gulf of Maine. Um, oops, sorry about that. Um, <coughs> temperature is not the only thing that's changing, though. And this is, um, I would encourage you, if you want to learn more about how the Gulf of Maine is changing and the coast of Maine is changing, uh, the State of Maine Climate Report that was initiated and um, uh, funded through uh, the governor, governor's office um, was published in 2020. And, uh, you know, other, other than temperature, there's a whole host of other things that are changing. Sea level rise is changing. So in general, Generally speaking, you can look at this plot right here and see those different colors. They're all on the rise, right? There's an upward trend. And that trend is a rise in sea level in inches. So you've got Portland, you've got Midcoast Maine, and Down East Maine. You've got different locations. These are measured through complex surveys and tide gauges. But the bottom line is there's sea level rise that we're actually able to document and has been published. So that's a concern as well, on top of the temperature issue. Uh, the other thing is pH. So the um, intrusion of low pH water uh, that comes in from uh, around Nova Scotia there, that's our, the way the current works in the Gulf of Maine, it pushes water in a counterclockwise way. And that fresh water seems to be a little bit more acidic. Um, and so that lower, pH water has impacts on shellfish, like lobster, like mussels, and also in crabs as well. Probably green crabs, um, but no, we haven't really looked at that too well. So that's another thing is that water chemistry is changing, especially around estuaries and shallow coastal systems. And finally, the last thing that I want to talk about that's really changing in the Gulf of Maine are our fisheries. If you look at this graph here. Um, this is the percent of um, landings uh, So, in, in, throughout the Gulf of Maine by decade uh, over 10-year periods starting in the 1950s. And what you'll notice is each color corresponds to, a, to different species. And you'll see those colors change. And if you just look at the two ends, of, you look at the first bar and the last bar, um, you'll see that there's quite a few invertebrates. You know, your lobsters are really, you know, taking over as well as, you know, invert other shellfish like scallops. And then the fish, you know, there, there's a much lower percentage of fish in those mean landings. So the, the composition of things that we catch in the Gulf of Maine is changing, temperature is changing, the water chemistry is changing. And so the reason I'm harping on all this, and it's probably more information than you need, is it makes it, a, it creates a ripe situation for invasive species, for intruders, for animals that don't really belong here or that are here and uh, are now pro proliferating at, you know, 
really, really rapid rates. And so enter the green crab. Uh, the green crab is really the poster child for that example that I just talked about. It has been here for over 200 years. Uh, this, this map here simply shows you um, uh, the entry points of green crabs throughout the Gulf of Maine and the Northeast. So if you look at where we're located, you know, we're talking about, you know, the 19, uh, you know, 1930s, 1940s was uh, the introduction into Maine, uh, although 1817 is the documented date uh, that green crabs were probably introduced into Long Island Sound and then spread up into Maine by about 1900. Um, and to go the extreme, we've got cases of green crabs in Newfoundland around 2007. So there's been a northward push of green crabs, a northward expansion into the Canadian Maritimes. But essentially, we've had crabs here for well over 100 years. And uh, so they've had lots of time to acclimate. They've had lots of time to, um, to set up shop, if you will. And uh, by the way, green crabs are native to Europe, just so you know, they're native to the Mediterranean, parts of the Mediterranean and to European waters. So they came over presumably in ballast water and that's been pretty well documented. So how does that translate to Maine and how does that translate to our little neck of the woods here down in Wells? Well, about 10 years ago, um, we had a study to examine just examine the numbers of green crabs throughout some of the marshes and estuaries in southern Maine. So we looked at um, Penobscot Bay, Dermascotta River, Casco Bay, and Wells. And um, there was a trapping program, program that was set up. So you see that barrel trap there at the foot of um, Emily's feet there. That's just a standard barrel trap. It's about a meter long or so. And we set barrel traps in all these different marshes, fish them throughout, I think, uh, a full summer at regular intervals, and basically caught all the crabs, measured them all up, and found out this is what we found out, essentially. There's way more graphs than this, but this is one of my favorite all-time graphs because it's a really uh, very dramatic uh, graphic way to tell you that Wells has a lot of green crabs. Um, this was a, a report that came out in 2016. And um, yes, Yarmouth has green crabs, Dara has green crabs, all the other places have green crabs, but Wells excelled at green crabs. And so we were really left with the, you know, befuddled and said, well, why do they like Wells so much? You know, what is it about Wells? Um, and I don't really have an answer for you, um, except that we're still trying to understand that. Green crabs um, have a uncanny way of also bur burrowing in the sides of marshes. So if you look at this marsh bank here, right, you see the upper platform of the marsh, the marsh platform, you see the, the tidal creek there below. That marsh bank has probably been <clears throat> worked on by green crabs over the years and has been sloughing. So you see those burrows um, allow the intrusion of more seawater and that creates instability. So one of the things that we think green crabs are doing is they're destabilizing some of our marshes. Um, sea level rise is arguably also doing that, but um, one of our previous research coordinators, Dr. Kristen Wilson, um, pictured here in this slide, she actually had a genius idea. They, she actually uh, put cores into the marsh. So imagine you drill down, it, this is a manual core that you sort of, an auger that you drill down by hand and you undrill it and you come up with a core and the cross section, you're taking a cross section of the marsh and she found a great way to understand what was in that core by putting it through a CT scan. So if anybody's ever had a CT scan for medical reasons, you know that you go in there and they take a whole bunch of scan, scanning images and um, they can see what's going on. And in here, in this case, 
we've got crabs that were almost a meter down in the marsh. So there's evidence that green crabs are able to not only burrow, but they're able to survive and take up refuge, you know, in the deep refuges of some of our marsh um, mud banks, which is a little bit alarming. Um, the other thing that green crabs are really good at is predating. They're very good at eating things. And one of their favorite things to eat are soft shell clams. So there's been a whole bunch of studies done by uh, Dr. Brian Beal um, from University of Maine at Machias. Dr. Beal uh, looked at um, the number of green crabs in clam flats. And of course, we have the honor of the distinction of being having the highest density of green crabs uh, compared to all these other places you see in this first graph at, on the top. And then we also have one of the lowest recruitment densities of baby clams into those mud flats. One of the reasons could be predation. So these, these crabs are preying and eating and consuming and devouring these small little soft shell clams. So one of the things that the wells um, they've done at the harbor is try to raise baby clams to a bigger size so that uh, these green crabs cannot predate, can, can't really eat them or they can't eat them as readily. Um, green crab abundance over time in southern coastal Maine um, looks something like this. Uh, if you look in the north, uh, green crabs were absent for a while and now they're showing up in bigger numbers. So if you look across um, horizontally, uh, for example, at like Chibi there, uh, you'll see, you know, we started picking them up in 2018, 2019. The size of the circle gives you is bigger numbers. Bigger the circle, more higher density or higher abundance. In the south, we've had them a lot longer, but um, they're consistently here. So again, the impacts from green crabs are widespread. Um, they have rapid population growth. We know that they prey on native species. They can outcompete other species that live in the marsh. Um, they contribute to destabilizing marsh mud banks. And um, however, they may be, we may be able to use them and, and fish them for some particular reason or purpose. And that's really what I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about is what can we understand about these green crabs to um, to utilize them as a resource and pull them out of the system. Uh, we've written about <coughs> green crabs. We've got a few publications looking at the interactions of green crabs and lobster. Um, we've done some work within, our, within the reserve system with other reserves, looking at the impacts of green crabs in estuaries and the impacts of crabs um, along those marsh platforms. So we've, we've done so, a fair amount of work on this, but we still have a lot more to do. So um, can I, does anybody have any questions? I can take a, a quick breather and see if anybody has anything they'd like to ask. I have a question. <laughs> How do you distinguish a green crab from an Asian shore crab? And are the Asian shore crabs also invasive? Uh, so yes, they are invasive. Um, they're, they came here a little, uh, quite um, later than green crabs. You can identify them. Uh, they don't have those five spines. So that's one, one way that you can differentiate them from green crabs. Uh, they also have these, their legs are fairly striped. Um, and they don't get as big as, as some of the green crabs we, that we see. Um, we don't see a lot of Asian shore crabs in our marsh. In fact, I don't think we've ever seen one. Um, they're typically relegated to rocky intertidal zones. So you'll see them, like if you're in um, like some of the intertidal areas, rocky intertidal areas um, in Southern Maine and you lift up rocks, you'll often find them underneath there. Um, but they don't typically reside in marshes. Uh, we haven't seen them. So that's probably a good thing. Um, but that's, those are some characteristics you can use to differentiate them. Does that help? 
Yes, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. A question too. Sure. So um, at the beginning, you said that you were using green crabs as a sentinel organism. Um, mm -hmm. Do you mean that you're just watching it through, through um, the research you do, or do you have like a specific monitoring protocol? Yeah, we're going to get into that. Um, yes, we, we do use them for specific things. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. Okay. Um, so, so really to your point, Amy, um, we use trapping, we use pitfall traps and we count burrows in the marsh. So that's, that's one way that we can get at, Hey, how many crabs do we have in certain areas? Um, what's their density? Um, how many burrows do we find? Um, but there's other things we can do. Um, some other like very high tech things. These are very low tech things and they're very effective. And if we do them year after year, we, we can really amass a very interesting data set. Um, in 2018 and 2019, we collaborated with uh, Dr. Nathan Fury from University of New Hampshire. And uh, we had a Hollings Scholar student named Jessica. And we went out and we um, tagged some green crabs in Wells Harbor, uh, and we tagged them with these ultrasonic uh, telemetry tags. So it's essentially, it's a, it's a tag, it looks like a, like a tic-tac. Um, you affix it to the back of a crab, <coughs> and you can see we used uh, really high-tech materials. We used duct tape and crazy glue to do that, um, and shrink wrap. And those tags are able to ping a, at a fixed interval, and they ping their uh, distinct identification number. So if we have enough receivers in the water, we can record where those crabs are going and which crabs are going where. And so we did this back in 2018 and 2019. I think we tagged um, about 20 or so crabs. Um, you can't tag a lot because the tags are about $400 each and you can't reuse them. So once the battery dies on them, um, you don't use them again. So it's an expensive endeavor, but it gives you an unbelievably detailed amount of information about individual crabs. Um, we set this study up in Wells Harbor. We also had uh, an intern, uh, Katrina Zarella smith uh, heavily involved in this project. And uh, this, this was just a great project we ended up publishing a paper about this and we found that crabs in fact the different types of green crabs male crabs crabs with eggs crabs that didn't have eggs went to and utilized different parts of the estuary and we published this last year and it was really groundbreaking for us because for the first time we had really detailed information about which parts of the estuary these crabs are using and so we're now piggybacking off of this and we've, we've done, done a repeat of this study uh, last year and the year before. And we will have more information to share with you about what we found with a larger group of crabs that we tagged. So essentially one of the biggest take homes was that crabs do move to different parts of the estuary depending on the time of year. And that's a really important piece of information for um, mitigation strategies, because if you're thinking of fishing green crabs out of a particular area, you now have some information where you can target like a hot spot for some of these crabs. And we, we definitely found that to be true. Um, the other kind of high tech thing that we've been playing around with is using eDNA um, as a way to detect green crabs in the environment. So what is eDNA? Well, I think um, you all probably know what DNA is, right? The genetic material that all living organisms possess. Um, eDNA is, in, the E stands for environmental DNA. So it's, this is DNA that sort of essentially leaches out into the water and into the sediment. Um, it could be uh, produced from scales or sloughing off of skin, you know, if you're a fish. But if you're a crustacean, it could be, um, it could be other things like the eggs that you carry. It could be um, 
the urine that you're you know putting into the water so there, there's a lot of different things that contain eDNA and so we were wondering if crabs if you could detect green crabs you know large concentrations of green crabs by using eDNA and what we found was um, without going into all the details here was that ovigerous lobsters these are lobsters that have eggs that's what an ovigerous crab you know vigorous uh, uh crab rather not lobster sorry um and you can see on this graph that sediment and water had the highest amount of edna when it when you had a crab that was hatching her eggs or possessing those eggs and that was really a very cool result for us because that allowed us to understand um where you might be able to pick up large concentrations of egg bearing crabs uh, whereas males and females that didn't have eggs um, they, we had very little eDNA that we could pick up from the environment and we think there's a really good reason for that um, because crustaceans like crabs are have hard shells and they're probably not leaching a lot of DNA into the environment so that's one of our guesses but again something that we might pursue in more detail later but what we are pursuing is these um, another round of these movements of, of green crabs so in 2021 and 2022 um, we're working with um, emily burke who's a graduate student at the university of new hampshire and this is part of her master's project and we're collaborating with her and we set up a very intensive uh, array of listening stations so all these different colored balloons here that you see on the map are different receivers in different parts of the estuary. Um, we released something like 40 crabs, uh, somewhere between 30 and 40 crabs in Wells Harbor uh, last year. Many of them had eggs. So we were really trying to determine, again, trying to really hone in on where these crabs are going when they hatch their eggs, because that is part of something we want we want to understand where they go why they go where they go and how we could use that information um, for harvesters if they're trying to harvest soft shell crab or crabs with eggs things like that so um, stay tuned for more information about that because we're still working up all that data um, so i've already explained to you that green crabs are invasive in in wells and in Maine and in the United States, essentially, um, and, they, and the harm they do. Um, people, some people eat them. And so we're, in fact, if you go to Venice, Italy, um, green crabs sell for about 50 euros a pound. And they're highly coveted. And one of the best um, markets they have in Venice is soft shell green crabs. So they wait for the green crabs to molt. Then they take the soft shell crab and they sell that. And that's a delicacy. So if you've ever had, for example, soft shell blue crab, which is essentially a very big thing in Virginia and Maryland and Chesapeake area, um, that's the same thing. You can, you can really, you really have a market for that. So the question is, is that something that is marketable here in Maine? And the answer is we don't, we're not really sure, but there are people that are working on this. And so um, the problem is, is if you pick up a green crab, it's almost impossible to know uh, if it's gonna molt or not. In other words, there are some signs you can look for, but they are very, very subtle. Um, we have spent two years trying to learn how to do it and we're still not great at it. So what we decided to do for this project was take a bunch of green crabs and see if we can visually identify those pre-molt markers and then try to find another way that we can predict when those crabs are gonna molt. And so the way that we're trying to do that is use their blood. So a fancy way to say blood for crustaceans is hemolymph. So blood, um, blood in crustaceans is very different from mammalian or human blood. Um, first of all, it's clear, uh, it doesn't contain iron, uh, it's just it's chemically very very different from from our hemoglobin that we possess. So we're trying to use blood because we know in other crustaceans 
the blood changes, the color of the blood changes um, before uh, they molt. This is very true in lobsters. So what we decided to do, again, as a way to think about creating a soft shell fishery or helping out harvesters who are already doing this is grab some green crabs, which is really easy to do because if you throw a trap off of a dock, you're gonna catch literally hundreds um, within a couple of days. So you've got hundreds and hundreds of crabs that you can go through. We find the ones that are probably visually the most appear to be molting, want, want to be molting. We put them in this crab condo tray, which is this floating tray, which has all these little condos or little cells. And we got one crab in each cell and they kind of hang out in there. And then about twice a week, we, um, we draw a blood sample from them. So the, this is a syringe. These are different, these are different um, hemolymph samples, blood samples from these crabs. And you can see they're different colors. And those different colors correspond to the amount of protein that's in the blood. Um, we also tried using calcium, but I'm not gonna talk about that today because um, it was way more complicated than we thought and it didn't work so well. Um, but blood protein, you draw some blood, you put it on this meter here, you look, it's like a little telescope with a gauge inside and it tells you how much protein is in the blood. And this is used very commonly in other crustacean studies, especially for lobster. Um, so we did this for over 150 crabs. We did this over the entire summer. Actually, we're still doing it. Um, and here's what we found. Um, we found that the initial protein concentration in green crabs does change for crabs that are molting and crabs that are not molting. So really the two boxes to look at are the pink box and the green box. So the pink box is telling you, hey, these crabs molted. And right before they molted, their protein concentration was pretty high. Um, that thick black line tells you they had an average of about 10. And that's just a unitless number that tells you you've got a protein concentration of 10. Um, whereas if you were a crab that didn't molt at all, uh, you were much lower than that. That's what that green box is. So we found in general that blood protein and blood color, the color of the blood, actually can tell you a lot about whether these crabs are getting ready to molt. And so we're hoping, um, we're hoping that, that the harvesters that are actually doing this will be able to take advantage of this technique if they wish to um, use that, sort of have that in their toolbox as a way to uh, help them inform the crabs that they're, that they're harvesting, whether they're gonna molt or not. Um, there are some harvesters in the area that are really good at visually identifying pre-molt green crabs, and they don't really need that technique. Um, there are other harvesters that are just getting into, the, getting into this, and they need all the help they can get. So, we're hoping that we're going to officially write this up as a protocol and be able to share it with, um, with the end users, in this case, harvesters uh, throughout the area and see if that helps them or not. <clears throat> um, green crabs are so popular now, are becoming popular in, in restaurants too. I know of a few restaurants that sell green crab. Um, there's a green crab cookbook. Uh, there's people who hold culinary demonstrations. So although we may not make a very big dent in the natural population, it is um, an option to be able to use them, utilize them in other ways. So um, that's been a really exciting project, uh, but I am also excited to wrap it up because it's been a lot of very tedious uh, examination of a lot of crabs. And so, um, I'm hoping we'll be able to get through that soon. Um, I'm gonna skip a couple things here, only to say that besides working with adult crabs, we are also, uh, those plankton toes that I told you about earlier, where we're, we're putting plankton nets off of Wells Harbor Dock about four times a month, 
we're collecting um, invertebrate larvae. So uh, sometimes we catch little baby crabs. And this is a picture of some larval crabs. And we, we worked um, on creating an ID key so we can identify the difference between a larval green crab and a larval, let's say, rock crab, which is a native species um, for a larval blue crab, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this is another tool that we have in our toolbox to match up the influx of um, larval animals, larval crabs in this case, into our estuary. And we had a, um, an intern a few years ago put together this really that she went through all a bunch of our invertebrate uh, larval samples that we had uh, maybe back about five or six years. And she identified the number of larvae of each of these um, five species of crabs that you see pictured here. So the carcinus one is in pink. And then some of the native species, the, the, the cancer species are in purple. There's blue is blue crab. Um, we have hermit crab in red, and we have uh, Asian shore crab in green. And you can see that there were definitely these peaks, there were these times of year where you had a huge influx of larvae that we would get in our plankton catch, um, mostly green crab. You see those, those tallest peaks with the arrows there are um, the presence of green crab larvae. So there's two, two take homes here. One is that green crab larvae sort of swamp the system. We get lots of larvae and we get them pretty much over the entire summer and into the fall, but we have these three distinct, distinct peaks, you know, in late August, early September, October, and then November. And we need to flesh this out a little bit more because we now have more samples. And so we'll, we'll be able to build on this with more samples that we have. Um, but this is an important piece of information um, for uh, understanding that connection between the movement of uh, egg bearing crabs and the presence of larvae and the timing of all those things. So the coupling of that telemetry project and the plankton toes, the plankton study is really important for us. Okay, I just have a couple more things I want to I want to end on and follow up with. Um, a lot of people ask, is this out of the ordinary? So what do I mean by that? In other words, all this green crab stuff that's been going on, the huge, um, the, the huge, you know, uh, burgeoning population of green crabs we have, the, all the changes that are occurring in the Gulf of Maine that we talked about earlier, um, the impacts that they have, is this something that is new? Have we seen this before? And back in the 1950s, um, and this is a picture from Essex, Massachusetts. Uh, this is the clam commissioner from that town. And uh, this is, a, if you look hard enough, you'll see those are all green crabs. Um, and they were implicated in a huge die off of soft shell clams back in the 1950s. So, you know, the question is, is this history, history repeating itself? Is this a biological cycle? You know, is this cyclical? Um, we don't really know, other than to say that um, when you change the conditions and make it more hospitable for things like green crabs, they're going to push out a lot of the native stuff. And it's going to make it easier for them to maintain a bigger hold on that system. So. Even if it's happened before, it seems to be happening even more intensely now. And that's why collecting all this data is really important. Um, one other thing I want to point out is just when we think we've got it all figured out, we think, yep, our whole estuary is full of green crabs. Uh, about three years ago now, we found our first blue crab. So this is a picture of me wow. with a blue crab in my hand. Um, that, that blue crab is dead because I would not be holding it with my bare hand. So it's, um, they are very feisty. They're very aggressive. And those of you who 
knows anything about blue crab know that they're not really common in Maine. Mm -hmm. um, have they been recorded in Maine? Yes. Um, they've been recorded in Canada as well, but more of an, more on the on the level of infrequent occurrences. Uh, we're seeing them as common occurrences now, uh, especially in one of our marshes. So we have now set up a new monitoring program mm -hmm. for blue crabs, doing many of the same things that we're doing with green crabs, like setting out traps, uh, looking at using eDNA to find out what they eat. Uh, tagging them. Uh, we have a pilot tagging study that we just put, um, that we just started up this year. So lots and lots of things. And it's almost, I had an intern tell me yesterday, it's really hard to keep up with how climate change is impacting our system because some of these changes are very quick. Mm -hmm. And so I would um, subscribe to the fact that blue crab has been a pretty quick range expansion from its more southern um, southern range. And so with that, um, I'm going to wrap up here because I know we're getting near the end and I wanted to leave some time for questions. Uh, but if you have any questions, you want to email me, that's my address. Um, if you um, find a blue crab at all, please send us a picture, um, but make sure it's a blue crab uh, because make, they don't have uh, that if it has five spines, like I showed you earlier, it's not a blue crab, it's a green mm -hmm. crab. So if you find any remnants of a blue crab or you think you might have one, let us know because we are trying to track their distribution in Southern Maine. So that's it. I, I'm going to stop the share option here so I can see everybody and um, see if anybody has questions. I have a question. Okay. <laughs> Do you, would you be willing to go back to the, the slide with the syringes and speak to the numbers? Oh, yeah. You had three syringes all with different color fluids and I'm just curious, yeah. what's the significance of the numbers and the, oh, yeah. I'm sorry. which, I'm which of those numbers. colors is the protein? I'm curious. Right. I'm <laughs> so the, the numbers are just simply the crab number. Okay. That's like crap 17, 18, 19. Okay. But if you look at the, look at syringe 19, mm -hmm. um, look how clear that blood is. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's likely not a pre-molt crab. That's okay. probably what we call an intermolt crab, a uh, crab that's not, not planning on molting anytime soon. Okay. But if you look at the syringe all the way to the left, that you see it's almost like amber color. Mm -hmm. That's probably a, a crab that is sequestering um, high numbers of protein for um, purposes of molting. Okay. For that or it, it's been eating really well. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the enigma because it's very hard sometimes to match up the visual cues with the actual blood chemistry. Mm -hmm. And so it's not a perfect system by any means. Right. Just a way to gauge. Um, it's just another tool and another way to, another indicator to help inform us about these animals. You know, if you go to Venice, they don't do this at all. They, um, from what I understand, they just have these large sorting tables and they're sorting through thousands of crabs in a day. And for some reason, they just know how, they just know which crabs to pull aside. And um, it's a huge, it's a pretty big business there. Um, okay. I don't know, and I'm not sure we'll ever be at that level here. And, uh, but there are, there's a very successful harvester in York. Um, his name is Mike Macy. He's been on TV, he's been on NPR. Um, he's been working with us actually. And um, he has been very successful at harvesting pre-malt crabs, holding them, and then selling them to uh, high-end restaurants in the area. Mm. Thank you. You're welcome. Jason, I have a question. Um, I'm wondering whether you have any sense whether your larval crabs in your, in your, uh, in your river, in your estuary, are coming from crabs that are in your estuary or outside? Mm -hmm. So are they, are they coming in with ocean currents? Are they somebody else's crabs and the larvae are coming in? Yeah. Or um, just 
That's, That's a great question. Oh, by the way, hi, Suzanne. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so can I just put you on the spot a minute? Sure. Suzanne is, um, came to Wells Reserve this summer, and she, um, she and some of her staff and interns uh, shadowed us for a few hours, and we showed them how we were doing all this stuff, and it was great. And I think, if I, correct me if I'm wrong, Suzanne, you, Suzanne is setting up a, um, some, you know, monitoring herself with her program down in Agunquit. And it would be great to find out how that's been going at some point. We don't have to do it now, but um, so I wanted to say thanks for your interest. Thank in you. Well, but to answer your question, because <laughs> you're not going to let me get off that easy, right? I. <laughs> I don't know. I don't really, I, we're not sure. Um, it's always, you know, a big question is where, what's the larval source? You know, where are they coming from and where are they going? And um, the telemetry, the tagging of some of these, we tagged a fair number of egg bearing crabs exactly for that reason, because we really wanted to learn a, a lot more about where they're going when they hatch. Um, and, we, and yes, we're not tracking the larvae. Um, someday, I think there'll probably be ways that you can do that. Um, so one of the things we did was we took a subset of uh, egg-bearing crabs, we kept them in those condo trays, and we checked them like weekly to find out when, how long they held those eggs for and when they hatched those eggs. And so that, served, that essentially serves as a proxy to understand uh, crabs that are free roaming with the same type of egg mass and how long it takes them at a particular temperature you know, to hatch out. So that at least gives us the timing because believe it or not, that's not even known around here. Right. Um, there's one paper that I found that talks about egg development in green crabs, but it's not even remotely close to where we are. So that's one way of understanding it. The other way of understanding it is using the telemetry and then using and then recruiting an oceanography type person to help us understand water flow and currents and see and do these particle mo of models so that you basically dump a lot of make-believe larvae on a computer screen and you hit go <laughs> and the currents and the oceanographer will tell you, well, here's where those larvae will disperse in, you know, up as particles. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that those particles are just particles and real larvae ha may have behaviors that can help control where they go. And so it's a complicated, very complicated kind of like um, modeling. Um, we are not doing that, but someday we might partner with somebody that could help us do that. So I think you got to know your system, not just biologically, but from a physical point of view as well. Um, your area, like where you're located, is probably different from us. Um, but we all connect to the Gulf of Maine. So, you know, when we talk about blue crabs, it's, it's I guess, it's possible that blue crab larvae have entered our system and have successfully become blue crabs, right? But I, I can't, I don't have I don't have information that can tell you that definitively, right? Got it. So that's a great question, though. Has your has your telemetry been able to indicate anything that you think might be like breeding grounds? Are you are you um, are you specifically tagging some of the larger mature males that are known to? Yes. compete the smaller ones in the breeding grounds yes yes to all of that um <laughs> we we were able to tag many more than we did back in 2018 and so and we're still learning we're still looking at all that data with telemetry data it's, there's thousands and thousands of data points um what we are sort of seeing is that egg bearing lobsters are doing different things of uh, egg bearing crabs rather are doing are showing different patterns of movement and moving to different areas 
than let's say large mature males. And they're using a lot of the estuary, uh, but they're not using it, they're not, they're not using all the estuary all the time. So, and I think it just depends on the type of estuary that you're doing your study. You know, if you're doing wells, harbor is a pretty small estuary, which makes it really great for this kind of study because you can really cover the whole area and hear crabs all the time. Um, if we were doing this in Great Bay or Casco Bay, uh, it's a much bigger system and you'd have to make some compromises about what questions do you want to try to tackle. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. I can start picking on people. How about Eileen? Eileen, you always have a question. Maybe not tonight. Okay. Can you hear me? Oh yeah, I can hear you. <laughs> I was just wondering if there's some way <clears throat> to sort of sequester the females <clears throat> or whatever, whichever ones you want to molt and somehow induce it somehow, either, either by <clears throat> temperature change or, <clears throat> I don't know, if it can be manipulated. It can be manipulated. Um, you can do it in lobsters by cutting their eye stock off. Oh. Yeah. Because yeah. They, happen to have, they happen to have a <clears throat> hormone that gets produced that uh, helps control their molting cycle. So if you remove that, then it throws their molting cycle completely out of whack and they end up molting more frequently. Mm. Uh, they don't have very good survival rates. <coughs> so um, I don't know what would happen. We've talked about doing this for green crab in the lab, um, you know, like on a very small scale uh, by heating up the water, right? You increase their metabolic rate. And so what that, that effect has on most, you know, ectothermic animals like, you know, that don't control their body temperature, um, it would, could invariably cause them to molt sooner. Um, but to do that on a commercial scale is probably, I'm not sure if that's like cost effective. <clears throat> you know what I mean? I just remember that um, having gone to New Zealand one time where there are many, many sheep, I watched a sheep shearing um, demonstration. But then years later, I read that they put something in their feed, some sort of little hormonal trigger, and they lose their fur without even having to, um, they, they wrap them up in something like you would put a Christmas tree in, and within days their, their uh, fur, their wool comes off, and they, they've never had to be sh uh, shorn with uh, clippers. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but- I have not remarkable. heard of that. <laughs> Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I mean, there's there's all kinds of things in the oyster industry. They can get baby oyster, like oyster spat to settle by injecting certain chemicals into the water that are uh, triggers for settlement to get them out of the water column and down to the bottom. Mm. Um, but molting is really co complex and lots of crustaceans don't succeed at molting. Actually, more than you. Now, there could be could be effect of just being in captivity, but um, yeah, it, it, it's a function of nutrition. It's a function of water temperature. It's a function of overall health. I think. So I I, I just don't know if that's a cost effective way if you're looking at somebody who wants to harvest commercially that way. Because electricity just, just a thought. Is, yeah, it's a great thought. <clears throat> yeah, it's a good idea. Right. So, Jason, I see that we're a few <laughs> minutes past seven. So, um, if anyone has further questions, uh, you can see Jason's email address there, jgoldstein at wellsner.org. And um, he can field them through email. 